Hey, good morning, Las Vegas. Uh, thank you for coming to the coveted first talk of the second day. Really appreciate you guys waking up, shaking off the hangovers. Um, this talk has actually been renamed to fit the chintzy Italian theme. This is now the factoring Visigoths preparing for the Cyber Pompeii. So just in case you're in the wrong room. Um, I'm Alex Damos. This is Javed Samuel. Tom Ritter is going to be coming up here a little bit later. Uh, they're with Isaac Partners. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Isaac Partners. I now run a division of the same company called Artemis Internet. Um, and we're here to talk about crypto and how it's going to break. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick introduction. Uh, then we're going to have a little bit of a math section. I'll give you a warning when that starts. Um, Tom's going to talk about how that math could impact uh, cri real crypto systems. And then I'm going to come back up here and talk about how that affects real software. So why are we here in this room? Um, First is that in the crypto security world, there's a huge disconnect between the academics who work on theory and the practitioners who actually build real systems. Uh, I, I like to say that the, the most dangerous red book since Mao's is Applied Cryptography by Schneier. Um, and that's because uh, a huge number of engineers read that one book and then believe that they are now qualified to build crypto systems that billions of people use. And um, it's a great book and it's a good introduction to what cryptographic primitives do what, but you cannot read one book like Applied Cryptography and then accurately put those primitives together in a way that's trustworthy. Um, and most engineers never get beyond that. The vast majority of security practitioners uh, don't have a formal mathematic background. I think that's fine. I don't have a formal math background. Um, and certainly the vast majority of them don't keep uh, abreast of the, the new academic literature. Uh, but honestly, it's the 2010s. Uh, things are getting a little more interesting in this space. A lot of the systems we build that used to be attacked by uh, teenagers uh, looking to, to get their name up in lights uh, or gangsters are now attacked by people who are sponsored by nation states, people who have mathematical teams behind them coming up with new cryptographic attacks and with supercomputer level uh, capability to uh, to, to do factoring and do other kinds of brute force attacks. Um, and so now we have to kind of step up our game as an overall industry. Um, so we're trying to bridge that gap a little bit. We, we do not claim to be the only people that do this. Uh, Dan Bernstein uh, is a personal hero of mine, is a guy who does a really good job uh, bridging this gap. Um, but certainly doesn't seem like anybody else is talking about this at, at Black Hat, so we thought it would be a good opportunity. Uh, so there's been a lot of news recently over the last couple of years about new attacks, practical attacks against TLS, Beast Crime, Lucky 13, RC4 bias attack. A lot of these attacks utilize uh, different kinds of uh, side channel analysis, uh, analysis of uh, crypto text to then try to, through often a chosen plain text attack, uh, with retrieve some of the, of the plain text. Um, I'm not going to take anything away from these guys. The people that invented these attacks are very smart people. They worked very hard to make it work. Um, there's even a new one here released at Black Hat 2013 called Breach by a team from Salesforce, an excellent attack that pulls the CSRF token out of a web page in about 30 seconds uh, by doing an active uh, JavaScript injection and then watching the, the, uh, the TLS connection. Um, these are great guys and this is great work, but none of it's really that unpredictable. Um, when these bugs came out, everybody was shocked, like, oh my god, TLS uh, leaks this kind of data via compression or, or padding oracles. Um, but if you were actually paying attention to the literature, uh, it turns out that this was all predictable. In fact, a lot of these things were predicted uh, in a paper that was written in 2002 by a guy named John Kelsey uh, in a journal that I know all of you read before you go to bed, um, the, the Journal of Fast Software Encryption, the Ninth International Workshop, right? I, I have that right on my nightstand um, for every night. Uh, but so in, in here we see a little bit of disconnect, right? If we had been reading those papers, uh, we probably could have foreseen these attacks and built these fixes into TLS well before TLS 1.2. Um, another great example is DES and MD5. So in 1998, the EFF had a, a prize to build a machine that uh, was able to crack DES, uh, and, and they, they did so in 56 hours, 56-bit DES. Um, in 2005, there were new mathematical breakthroughs and pre-image attacks against MD5. 2008, um, a number of researchers uh, worked together with a, a stack of PS3s to practically use this MD5 attack uh, against a number of certificate authorities. Um, in 2011, the CA browser forum, the people who were supposed to regulate the certificate authority industry, finally changed the rules to disallow MD5. So that's a nice fast three-year response cycle there. I was really proud of that. Um, in 2012, uh, no, I'm not going to do any attribution, um, but somebody uh, who wrote the Flame malware uh, pulled off a related kind of attack against an active Microsoft certificate authority server that was set up to give out uh, terminal server certificates. And they were able to trick, generate two CSRs with matching MD5s, submit one of them to get signed 
uh, by the terminal server, take the signature and they popped on the other one which just happened to be an intermediate certificate authority that is now chained up to the Microsoft root CA. Um, this was then used to do an attack against Windows update. Uh, so this is interesting in a couple ways. One, the math that was used to do this MD5 attack was brand new, never seen before in the open academic cryptography literature. Um, and then second, uh, these people pulled this off, uh, the, the Sodorov team um, did their work over I think four or five days with a PS3, like 300 PS3s. Um, these people did it in, in hundreds of milliseconds, uh, meaning they had something more than a couple hundred PS3s tucked away in their basement in Maryland. Um, and then even just yesterday there was a fantastic talk by Karsten Knoll um, on hacking SIM cards based upon the use of single DES, right? So in 1998, right, we're all wearing flannel still. Um, a lot of the people in this room were in high school or junior high. Uh, DES was shown practically uh, to be destroyable by uh, a bunch of liberal hippie lawyers um, and still we expect it to hold up against Karsten Null in 2013, uh, which is obviously kind of a ridiculous assumption. Um, so why, why do we have this disconnect? Well, one problem is most crypto systems are not built with cryptographic agility. It's very difficult to update these crypto systems without breaking backwards compatibility. You have to start from scratch on all of the different components that interact within that system. Um, another problem is that crypto is an ecosystem. This is especially true in the TLS PKI world. You need the client, the server, and the PKI provider to all be able to use the same algorithms and talk the same language. Few companies actually employ full-time cryptographers. Now this isn't totally accurate. There's a lot of companies that employ people who are trained as cryptographers who now work as software engineers. Um, there are very few companies that hire cryptographers and then pay them to sit around and read cryptography papers all day. Um, the only two I could, I know for a fact that I've met cryptographers at are Microsoft and Google. The vast majority of the software world does not have people just sitting around reading the academic literature and then trying to apply it to their internal systems. Now, I don't think that's reasonable to hire these folks. Um, a lot of them are really hard to interact with if you're just a normal human. Um, but, but certainly there's a gap here that needs to be filled somehow. Uh, it's, it's hard for InfoSec practitioners to keep up to speed. Um, clearly most of these breakthroughs are happening at these very obscure conferences around the world uh, that are, are not easy uh, for folks to get to and once you get there it's very hard to understand unless you've kept up with every single paper along the way. Um, and there's a lot of momentum in the professional consulting core, right? And this is uh, something I have some personal uh, uh, guilt here, right? Uh, us consultants form uh, somewhat of the backbone of the, of the industry of we go around to different companies and tell them what's right and what's wrong. And for a very long time we've looked at crypto systems and say, oh great, you're using RSA, you're using Diffie-Hellman, uh, use a little bit of a bigger key, right? We haven't pointed out any of the weaknesses that have been cropping up after the last couple of years. It takes a long time to turn that ship. Um, and as an industry we have failed to address this, this gap. Um, so why are we specifically here in this talk? So we thought you look at beast and crime and all these things that were predictable. Uh, a, a decade ago, if you were reading academic literature, we thought to ourselves, well, let's look what's the current hot stuff in academic research and what can we predict from that? And so our thesis, our conclusion from today um, is that there has in the last six months and basically all of the stuff we're going to talk about has happened in 2013, uh, there have been huge breakthroughs in uh, academic attacks against the discrete logarithm problem. These leaps have parallels in the past. Tom is going to talk about situations in the past where these kinds of leaps have happened and what the outcome was. Um, but our conclusion is there is a small but definite chance that RSA and non, in what we're going to call classic Diffie-Hellman, Diffie-Hellman not across elliptic curves, uh, will not be usable for security purposes within the next two to five years. Uh, and that looking at the ecosystem, we're not in a good place for us to make a switch to the only readily available alternative, which are algorithms based upon elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, and our hope is that this room becomes the seed of change to go out and start the work. So um, I want to make a couple things clear. First, when we say RSA today, we do not mean RSA the company. Um, people keep on confusing that. RSA the company is named after the algorithm, but RSA the company makes lots of products that might be vulnerable and a lot of products that aren't vulnerable to this kind of attack. So we're not talking about RSA the company, please do not sue us if you're from RSA the company. Um, we're also not talking about the Republic of South Africa or anything else that uh, the acronym RSA stands for. Um, the second thing I want to make clear is, you know, we're not saying this is definite, right? So if you're a reporter, please do not write the article, Alex Damo says RSA is broken uh, right now, panic. Um, and then please tweet him about how stupid he is, right? Like, don't write that. What we're saying is that if you look at what's going on right now, 
this is kind of like we're in the we're in the movie and the the generals just run up the stairs into the oval office and has given Morgan Freeman the picture of sir there's an asteroid that has a 10% chance of hitting the earth right um and Morgan Freeman says you know we've got to do something I can't do a Morgan Freeman but he says we're gonna have to do something about this right this is the crypto equivalent of the asteroid hitting the Earth. And even if there's a 10% chance of life being wiped out on Earth, you would hope that some massive percentage of world GDP would be uh, put together to try to mitigate that risk. Um, our goal is to get people to spend a little bit of the security GDP to mitigate this risk. We're not saying it's definitely going to happen. Um, I, I am going to say it's almost certainly going to happen uh, before we retire. So eventually this will be our problem. Um, but it could happen within the next four or five years for sure. Okay, so this is going to be the math section of the talk. Um, Javid and Tom are going to talk. Javid and Tom are much smarter than I am. I only understand about a third of the things they say, but what I do have the ability to do is I nod my head and I make sounds like I understand everything that's coming out of their mouths. Um, I'm going to recommend you do the same thing. This is going to be about 20, 25 minute portion of the talk. If you get up and leave during this, everybody else is going to look at you and say that person couldn't cut it, right? So <laughs> let's just all <laughs> nod along together. I'll be up here in the front. You can watch me nodding and, and making sounds and be like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, of course. Elementary, okay? So, uh, <laughs> Javid Samuel. Thank you very much for the introduction, Alex. So, we'll now talk about asymmetric cryptography. Asymmetric cryptography is an essential part of all modern crypto systems. It is what has allowed us to essentially move from the old Enigma machines used by World War II cryptographers to TLS which is used to secure communication over the, over the internet. I am sure that we have all used TLS and we have asymmetric cryptography to thank for this. We will now take a closer look at what exactly is asymmetric cryptography. Asymmetric cryptography relies on certain information being computationally difficult to compute without a secret. Asymmetric crypto systems generally contain a public component which can be known by everyone, including an adversary. However, it must not be possible to compute the private or secret key from this information. Doing so would completely break the crypto system. These mathematical functions are usually computationally difficult are not necessarily provably difficult. That means that an efficient algorithm may exist and just has not been found yet. Our crypto systems rely on that efficient algorithm not yet being discovered. If it is discovered, then the crypto system is broken. We will take a closer look at some of those crypto systems and the underlying mathematical functions now. RSA and Diffie-Hellman were first published in the 1970s and are used today in almost all crypto systems. They are used for a variety of purposes. This includes secure key exchange, encryption, and signing. Elliptic curve cryptography was first published in the academic literature in the 1980s and there has been significant academic interest in elliptic curve cryptography over the last few decades. However, there has been very limited use in industry. ECC is performed over a specified curve as opposed to Diffie-Hellman and RSA which are performed over the set of integers. In recent years, the NSA published Suite B recommendations and the Russians declassified GHOST which both recommend the use of elliptic curve cryptography. Again, like RSA and Diffie-Hellman, ECC algorithms can be used for key exchange signing encryption. We will now look a bit closer at Diffie-Hellman, which is, um, was first published by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman in 1976. As some of you may know, Diffie the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol allows you to establish a shared secret by exchanging data over a public untrusted network. This shared secret can then be used in a symmetric crypto system. The security of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange crypto system completely relies on the computational hardness of the discrete logarithm problem. To reiterate, 
That means if you solve the, comp the discrete logarithm, the discrete logarithm problem, you have broken the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So as I just pointed out, in order to attack Diffie-Hellman, what we need to do is solve the discrete logarithm problem. And what exactly is that? The discrete logarithm problem is, suppose you have h is equal to g to the x. The problem is to find the element x given that only g and h are known. This seemingly simple problem is the basis of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. Again, to reiterate, an efficient discrete logarithm algorithm will completely break the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. Also, since both Elgamal and DSA rely on slight modifications of the discrete logarithm problem, an efficient discrete logarithm algorithm will also break these crypto systems. Let us now move on to RSA. The first phase in the RSA crypto system is to compute an RSA modulus from two large primes. From that RSA modulus, we compute a public key exponent, E, and a, and, a, and a private key, D, that satisfy a particular mathematical relation. This public key exponent is then used to encrypt any message sent to the receiver. This is done by raising the message to the recipient's public key exponent. Then, the recipient of this ciphertext raises that ciphertext to their private key, D and the result is the original message. As with Diffie-Hellman, the security of RSA completely relies on a mathematical problem. In this case, the mathematical problem is factoring. Again, as we saw with Diffie-Hellman, to attack RSA, what we need to do is break the underlying mathematical function of factoring. Factoring, as we may remember from grade school mathematics, is a similarly simple task. I'm sure we all remember 35 is equal to 5 times 7. It's easy to compute by trial division, and it seems easy for small numbers. However, there exists no efficient algorithm to factor an arbitrary number. Factoring an RSA modulus would allow you to compute the two constituent primes of that modulus, and using the, user, the user's public key exponent, you can then compute the user's secret key with the same mathematical function that was used to generate it in the first place. Then, at that point, with an efficient factor and algorithm, you would be able to decrypt the ciphertext of the user. Now we'll take a look at elliptic curve cryptography. As we mentioned earlier, this was first published in academic literature in the 80s, and work has continued since then. An elliptic curve is over the real numbers is defined by something called the raised stress equation, and I've shown an example on the slide here. This strange, funky-looking curve is special and allows us to build even more secure crypto systems. Generally, you can use either a prime field or binary field, depending on the application, whether hardware or software. Now, as we saw earlier, ECC is also based on an underlying mathematical function. In this case, the ECC is secure due to the hardness of the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. This should not be confused with the classical discrete logarithm problem that we just described earlier. In this case, we are given two points on this elliptic curve. And the goal is to compute the integer d such that q is equal to dp. In the diagram I've shown here, d is equal to 2, which is a really simple case. The key pair is then d and q, d being the secret key, q being the user's public key. This can then be used in crypto systems for signature and for in signature encryption and decryption crypto systems. As with Diffie-Hellman, if an efficient algorithm exists, it, for this underlying mathematical problem, then the crypto system is broken. Let's take a look, quick look at some of the NIST recommended key sizes for various crypto systems. As we can see from this table, 
NIST recommends significantly smaller key sizes for ECC. This is due to the increased computational difficulty in solving the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem as opposed to factoring or classic discrete logarithm. Also, given current research, even key sizes in the same row in this table are not computationally equivalent. Now we'll move on to the next section and take a look at some of the new advances in the academic world related to this area. We'll look at some discrete logarithm algorithms. There were generally two types. A generic algorithm, which is a general purpose algorithm that uses a divide and conquer approach. They are very slow and take exponential time. I will go over complexity of algorithms in the next slide. Specific algorithms make use of particular group characteristics and can be much faster. An example is the index calculus algorithm used in the literature and they result in sub-exponential algorithms. They work by leveraging certain properties. Now let's take a look at algorith algorithmic complexity and why that matters. Algorithmic complexity is simply how fast does a given algorithm run? This, in the academic literature, discrete logarithm and factoring generally use L notation to indicate their complexity. L of zero is a polynomial um, algorithm and it means it's pra it's, it is practical. L of one is fully exponential and is not practical. Anything in between is considered sub-exponential. On the graphs I have shown below, to the left we have a linear running time plot you may only see one line. This is the exponential running time. All the other polynomial running times are adjacent to the x-axis and are not clearly, and are not really visible on this linear plot. In the logarithmic running time plot, one can see that the exponential time algorithm increases linearly there, while the polynomial algorithms um, plateaus to an asymptote. Now let's take a look at um, let's, let's take a look at the, 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 um, the, the state of discrete logarithm research. Currently, the fastest algorithm for elliptic curve discrete logarithm, the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem is still fully exponential. That is L of 1, as shown on this chart here. From the 1970s, there was a sub exponential algorithm for classical, for classical discrete logarithms. Note that L of one half is not half the running time of L of one. Then a few years later, there was further improvement when we had an L of one third algorithm published for discrete logarithms. And then there was little progress in academia for the next 30 years. There were some improvements to the constants and um, at the margins, but L of one third remained the barrier for discrete logarithms until this year when Antoine Drew published an L of one quarter algorithm for the discrete logarithm problem. While this algorithm is not generic and does not, and there are certain restrictions on the group, so it only applies to certain types of groups, it is still much faster than anything that was published before. And then a few months later, Antoine Drew and some other researchers improved this algorithm and got a quasi-polynomial algorithm. Again, it, it still only applies to certain groups. So as we can see, there has been rapid progress in the field of discrete logarithm research in the past six months. While these algorithms are limited they, and only apply to um, certain, certain, certain circumstances, namely small characteristics field, in practice we use large characteristics fields in almost all crypto systems right now. For the math nodes out there, the, the characteristics is simply the number of multiplicative identity elements that you need to compute the sum with the additive identity elements. Um, so the, the, those recent developments will bring more attention to the discrete logarithm problem and this will spur researchers into looking more closely at that problem and most likely will result in even further progress as we can see from the first paper in February to the next paper in June. Now let's look at, take a quick look at 
what exactly uh, Antoine Joe did in this new algorithm. The main thing to note is that he did not use any new fundamental mathematics. It did not require the invention of a new branch of mathematics. Instead, what he used was several mathematical tricks which sped up the running time of the algorithm significantly. It is remarkable that those techniques and tricks were not discovered earlier by any researchers in that area. Some of those techniques I have listed there, and these included a clever change of variables, a specific polynomial that sped up the computation, and the new descent algorithm to compute the individual elements. Again, this with these techniques or these tricks resulted in a significantly faster algorithm. And then immediately afterwards, a few months later, Joe and some other researchers published a algorithm which further improved his descent algorithm. In this case, they used some special matrix properties and as a result got the running time down to quasi-polynomial. This is a big deal since there was marginal progress for 25 years and then within six months there's been rapid and significant progress in the academic field. Note that there is no obvious jump to more practical implementations yet. But with renewed in interest in the field in academia, who knows? Some of the current implications of this progress right now is that parent-based cryptography, which is used mainly in academic circles, is no longer secure over small characteristics. There exists a polynomial time algorithm. There are limited practical implementations of this, though there is a public implementation maintained by the Stanford Crypto Group. Also, the function field sieve which will be discussed in more detail by Tom Rita in the next section, is improved by these new developments. The function field sieve is used mainly for small to medium characteristic fields. And with that, I will pass on to Tom Rita, who will discuss how this may apply to factoring. All right, so that's a lot of math. Let's talk about how this impacts or doesn't impact the algorithms that we use today before we talk about how it impacts the applications that we use today. So the function field sieve is what's used to solve discrete logs and it has four steps. And in the last six months, all of them have been improved. And that means it's way more likely that something will be applicable to an algorithm that we care about. We don't use fields of a small characteristic, we use fields of a large characteristic. It's also worthwhile to note that the computation times that people are setting records with are not supercomputer worthy. It's actually less than a month on a single core. And you can factor RSA in more time, it actually takes more time to do 512 RSA than the records they're setting. So Jew has attacked fields of a small characteristic, but in classic Diffie-Hellman, DSA, Elgamal, we use fields of a large characteristic. And Jew's specific improvements are hit or miss on applying to these types of fields. The polynomial selection probably doesn't apply, the sieving might, and the descent algorithm will need some tweaking and further work, but it will definitely lead to improvements there. And of course, the simple fact that everyone in the academic community is really excited about this stuff means we'll probably see even more improvements down the pipe. They're actually so excited about it, they're talking about it on Twitter. So what about RSA? Everybody uses RSA and we use it everywhere. And traditionally, discrete logs and factoring have been very closely linked. When we improve one, we tend to improve the other in short order. And we've seen this over the years. The dates that Javid threw out, those have seen advances right next to each other on the other algorithm, in the 70s, in the 80s, and in the 90s. And while I hate to think that we're going to call this decade the teens, we'll probably see a reflective paper nonetheless. But why are these two algorithms so closely related? Well, they have about the same steps. They both select a polynomial. They both sieve for millions and millions of relations. They perform this really big linear algebra step. And then they solve for the specific number that you want to get the factor, the, the factor components or the, the compute the discrete log of. So if that's how they're similar, let me explain how they're different. So in factoring, the polynomial selection takes some time, but it's not that fast, it's not that slow. In discrete logs, Jew has chosen his polynomial as a constant based off the type of group that he's working in. 
The relationship seeding in both takes time, but it's trivial to parallelize. In the era of EC2 and Google Compute Engine, any problem that's embarrassingly parallel and doesn't require the energy output of the sun tends to just have cores thrown at it and it's spread across and solved in short order. Now the linear algebra in both of them is slow and it's difficult to parallelize. It takes a lot of memory and it takes a lot of memory bandwidth plus a lot of CPU time. And it's also a little bit harder for discrete logs than it is for factoring. But the most notable difference is that the last step is way more difficult for discrete logs. The descent algorithm is extremely painful for discrete logs, but the analogous step, the square root, takes minutes for factoring. So they're very closely related, but they're not exactly analogous. So coming back to RSA, there's no obvious technique from Ju's work to directly apply to factoring, to the general number field sieve. And factoring RSA public keys is done via the general number field sieve. That said, if there's even a 5% chance, that's basically a 5% chance to throw every certificate authority, every single SSL session, every single software update mechanism into complete and utter disarray. And based on NIST publications and colloquiums, it seems like they're concerned too. And it's also worthwhile to note that factoring uh, RSA public keys using the general number field sieve, factoring 512 bit and even 768 bit keys is within you, the audience members, graphs. The software used to do this is public and open source and there are tutorials on how to factor 512 bit keys in under 30 hours. So right now, ECC is in pretty good shape. But we have to keep in mind that ECC has been around and studied for 30 years, while RSA and Diffie-Hellman, more importantly factoring and discrete logs, have been studied for hundreds of years. If Jew or others hit upon a general purpose discrete log algorithm, Diffie-Hellman and classic, uh, classic Diffie-Hellman, DSA, Elgamal, they're toast. And if that leaps to factoring, RSA is going to be toast too. And to give you an idea of what I mean when I say toast, I mean key sizes might have to go from 2048 to 1638. Besides being wildly impractical for any actual use because it's way too slow, there's like no software that supports key sizes that large. So at that point, let me hand it over to Alex to talk about just how screwed we are. So who here has seen Sneakers? Yeah, everybody. So Sneakers is a movie that lied to us in a number of ways, right? First, Sneakers convinced people that somebody who runs a white hat hacking shop looks like Robert Redford, which clearly uh, turned out not to be true, um, and that the NSA was run by a, a grandfatherly uh, James Earl Jones uh, who will come and pat you on the back um, if you steal something from them. Um, one of the things that we all thought Sneakers lied to us too was that Sneakers, the movie, is based upon the idea that there's this uh, cryptographer goes and invents a microchip that can decrypt all communication, which is still kind of a ridiculous idea, but this is about as close as you can get to the sneaker scenario in real life. Antoine Jew or one of these guys could be sitting there on a whiteboard, have a breakthrough, throw it out on one of the crypto mailing lists, and a practical attack against RSA, a modification of one of those already easily paralyzed software packages could be pushed out within a date or two, and all of a sudden RSA and Diffie-Hellman fall uh, immediately all around the world. Um, the moment, I just want to make it clear, the moment the academic breakthrough happens, there's very little implementation work um, that needs to be done. Um, and that, that's, that's a little scary. So, so what if that happens? So clearly we would see widespread active and passive attacks against both live and recorded TLS sessions. Um, a lot of people, because of the PRISM scandal, have been talking about perfect forward secrecy as a mitigation against certain types of attacks. Um, specifically people are saying, oh, if Facebook is required, for example, to turn over the RSA key to the NSA, perfect forward secrecy could protect uh, the communication. And that is true, assuming that the NSA doesn't have any way to speed up a Diffie-Hellman attack. But it turns out if you look at how perfect forward secrecy works, um, in a normal uh, TLS connection, you have the RSA communication, which is authenticated by the certificate. Uh, a, a number comes out of that that is then used to 
uh, sign a classic Diffie-Hellman handshake, but the Diffie-Hellman handshake is in plain text and can be visible. So if we had a discrete log solution, you could just watch that, skip the entire RSA part, and attack the Diffie-Hellman perfect forward secrecy to remove the symmetric key and then decrypt the rest of it. And in a scenario like that, perfect forward secrecy would not protect you either against active or passive attacks. Um, we'd have widespread failure of code signing and update mechanisms, uh, which means not only do all these systems not work, but there's no way to fix them in a trustworthy way. Uh, just this week, we've had two uh, incidents where um, uh, ISPs that should not have have advertised huge amounts of, of internet IP space that just happens to correspond with uh, things like the U.S. government uh, and major U.S. banks, um, which seems like very coincidental uh, that people would do these advertisements. If we had an attack like this, you would be able to go out, factor the RSA public key that under, underlies uh, Windows updates, that the master uh, Microsoft certificate, uh, do a BGP attack, and take over the, the Microsoft update IPs for a large portion of, of the world uh, and push down uh, bad patches. Um, we'd have failure of PGP and SMIME. PGP either uses usually uh, DH or DSA keys. Uh, both of those would be toast. Um, there seems to be no ECC standard. There's, there is some stuff in the RFCs, but none of the, the standard GPG uh, implementations seem to use ECC. Um, most end-to-end -end encryption stuff's not going to work. Um, basically, total failure of trust on the internet. So. so what do we do now? So clearly we need to make a move and our recommended move is to ECC. So now you can go and tweet. Alex Damos says the ECC is perfectly secure and will be secure forever and you can blame him and sue him if it's not. Um, that's not the statement I'm making. Uh, as Tom pointed out, uh, if, you know, if you've studied RSA at all, you know that the algorithm that allows you to do RSA very quickly if you have the private key is called Fermat's little theorem. Uh, Pierre Fermat lived in the 16th, uh, the 17th century. Um, and so we have 400, 500 years of research into the discrete mathematic problems that underlie RSA and Diffie-Hellman. We only have about 30 years of research into ECC. So there's no, uh, there's no guarantee that this kind of breakthrough can't happen with the ECC. Because as was talked about, the uh, elliptic curve discrete log problem is not provably hard. We just think it's probably hard. Um, but right now, honestly, it's, it's all we have. Um, there are other kinds of algorithms, uh, uh, other kinds of trapdoor functions that have been discussed. Um, there's a thing called lattice-based cryptography. Um, the most popular implementation of that is an uh, algorithm called NTRU. Unfortunately, NTRU is patented up the wazoo and almost certainly unusable uh, by anybody, and it's, it's not something you can turn on today. Um, Obviously, long term, we need to do a lot of research in these alternatives. The academic world needs to start looking into other mechanisms, trapdoor functions that be turned into practical crypto systems, and then the implementers need to study that research and figure out how to implement it. Uh, you know, today I checked. I did a logged into Google and I pulled down and I had used I used RSA to do the handshake and I used RC4 for the stream cipher, which is all work that Ron Rivest did either before I was born or when I was a child. Right? It's like we gotta give the guy a break. I mean, he's done enough for us, the world. The guy had a really good run, but, and Ron Rivest is a genius, but it's really impractical for us to base the entire world economy off of the work one guy did over a decade. Um, and, and this just kind of demonstrates this isn't Ron Rivest's fault, this is a little bit of laziness. Like he did a little bit of work in the 70s and then we're like, okay, great, we're, we're set. And we've just been coasting since then. I um, mean, it's time to, to kind of get our, our, off our asses and to, you know, do something without Ron Rivest having to save us again. Although it's possible, maybe Ron will swoop in um, and invent something and release the patent and we'll be set, so. Um, so why, why aren't we using ECC? I mean, there's been a lot of push from academia, a lot of push from the, the US and other governments. Um, but the unfortunate fact is uh, Diffie-Hellman and RSA are much easier understood and much easier implemented and this is kind of the standard default. There's also some interesting legal risks with ECC I'll talk about in a second. Um, and there used to be compatibility problems, although these days with Suite B and the NIST recommended curves, that shouldn't be a problem. What's Suite B? We keep on talking about Suite B. The, the slide before was incorrect. In 2005, Suite B was released. Um, there's also a Suite A. Suite A is the set of classified algorithms that the NSA recommends to be used for top secret and special compartmentalized information. Um, we know what the names of those algorithms are, but we don't know anything about the implementation or even the math problems that they're based upon. Suite A is classified. There's been no, so far, none of the Snowden leaks have told us anything about what Suite A actually is. Suite B was publicly published by the NSA saying for the U.S. government and for contractors, we want you to use a set of algorithms, again, for top secret or above information. Suite B specifies asymmetric encryption algorithm, which is AES-256, a key change algorithm, which is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, a digital signature algorithm, 
elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, and a hashing algorithm, SHA-256 and SHA-384. So what's missing from this list? RSA. RSA and classic Diffie-Hellman, integer Diffie-Hellman. That's right. So I think we can look, you know, a lot of people criticize the NSA, but them and the other agencies in the U.S. government that do this kind of work actually have a dual mission, right? There's a part of them that's offensive and that's doing spying on, on folks and finding offensive weapons and doing cryptography for off offensive purposes, but obviously there's a defensive component that's extremely important since uh, it would be really stupid to undermine trust in the internet when the United States has the most advanced and the most internet-based economy in the world. Um, and I think this is the defense side of the NSA giving us a hint. Um, I think after this all happens, we should look at the NSA as like that, that creepy man in the beginning of a horror movie that tells the kids, right, don't go down there, it's a haunted house or the city's haunted or whatever, because they have to have the choice and the teenagers are like, oh, crazy old man, I'm going to keep on using RSA, right? Um, <laughs> and I think that's what... What has happened here, right? Like the, the NSA told us, like, hey, if you're an American, you should use this. Iranians use RSA. But Americans, <laughs> please, uh, use Sweet B. Um, and we didn't listen. Uh, and it's eight years later and we're in much worse shape for it. Now, like I said, ECC has an interesting legal history that makes it somewhat difficult for people to implement. Um, it's the opposite of the RSA problem. So RSA was patented. The patent has run out. The RSA patent was on the basic idea of RSA. The elliptic curve patents are on the implementation, um, special implementation uh, functions that make ECC fast in software or hardware. These are owned by a company called Certicom. Certicom was started by a group of Canadian cryptographers uh, who in basically invented elliptic curve cryptography. Um, Certicom was a couple of years ago purchased by BlackBerry, the, the f company formerly known as RIM. Um, in theory, it is possible to implement elliptic curve cryptography without stepping on these patents, but it's somewhat of a fuzzy, murky world, and it's not totally clear which crypto systems uh, step on it, which don't. The NSA knew this was a problem, and so in 2005, when they released Suite B, they went to Certicom and they paid them some ridiculous amount of money to get a global uh, license for all Certicom patents on all U.S. government use of ECC. They also got a, a, a license for anybody who implemented ECC to either sell to the U.S. government or for FIPS certification. Note, that does not say for any product in the world. Um, you can still go to Certicom and you can purchase ECC licenses for your company, but some people say that's required and some people don't. Um, and, if, and if you think, oh, Certicom, Blackberry, Canadians, Canadians are nice, right? Canadians would never do anything mean. Um, you should go look in Westlaw um, and you'll find as late as 2007, um, Certicom sued Sony for the use of ECC algorithms within the Blu-ray encryption standard, which we all know worked out really well for them. Um, now, I'm not a huge fan of software patents, uh, but in this case, I mean, Certicom has a good, these guys actually really invented this algorithm. They have a reasonable claim to these patents. This isn't straight up patent trolling, um, but there are a couple of things that give me pause. Um, the first is that this lawsuit was filed in the Eastern District of Texas, in beautiful Marshall, Texas, a place known for its juries that are educated in the details of mathematical group representation um, <laughs> and the implementation of software, right? Uh, so if you've ever listened to This American Life when patents attack, episode, you'll know that Marshall, Texas is the epicenter of patent trolling. And when you file a lawsuit in Marshall, Texas, you're basically saying, I'm a patent troll. Now, I mean, obviously, BlackBerry makes products that use ECC. They're not a non-practicing entity, but this is kind of a slimy lawsuit from that way. Sony ended up settling for a huge amount of money, um, and so there hasn't been, Sony said there's a bunch of, they, they cited a bunch of prior art that they were going to try to use to attack the Certicom patents, but it never got to that point because they settled out of court. So nobody knows what they settled for. Um, ECC is pretty widely supported. Um, OS 10 has had support for a number of ECC algorithms since 10.6, Windows since Vista. Uh, Android has four different libraries that support ECC, which is uh, a common complaint about Android is that uh, if they can do something once, why not do it four or five times, right? Um, and so there are a bunch of different, not totally compatible mechanisms that you can use for ECC on Android. Um, Python, C, uh, there are good external libraries. Probably the most commonly used library in C uh, and for a lot of these languages is OpenSSL has, uh, re you know, since only a couple of years ago, had ECC primitives built in. Um, Java, before Java 7, you can use Bouncy Castle. Um, and then since Java 7, there has been native support for ECC built in. Uh, and like Ruby and some other languages like that, there are, there's a Ruby gem that will call out to OpenSSL for you and make it easy. 
From a code signing perspective, uh, unfortunately, almost pretty much everybody uses RSA or DSA. Um, Windows uses RSA. Win Verify Trust uh, API call is, is rooted down to an RSA key. Um, there is support for ECC, but it doesn't seem to be used by anybody or by Microsoft. Um, Android updates for both the operating system and the APKs themselves are signed either with DSA or RSA. iOS uses a standard called CMS, but the algorithm is RSA. While they, in theory, have support for elliptic curve, it doesn't look like they're using it right now. Um, TLS is clearly the most important crypto system we use on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the newest version of TLS, TLS 1.2, is the first to include support for ECC. But unfortunately, to implement the only required algorithm for TLS 1.2 is uses RSA and AES 128 um, and SHA-1. So three things that you probably shouldn't be using uh, is what everybody will be using when TLS 1.2 becomes widespread. Um, before TLS 1.2, ECC had a, another problem, which is that if you have a certificate authority and it signs a cert, they both have to use the same basic algorithm. That's been changed in TLS 1.2. You can now cross sign. An RSA cert can sign an ECC cert and vice versa, which gives us a lot more flexibility. Um, as of TLS 1.1, though, there is a kind of ECC that you can use, which is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman uh, ephemeral, which is used for perfect forward secrecy. So the, the RSA is actually used still to authenticate who it is, but then there is a, a perfect forward secrecy handshake to create the symmetric key. So in theory, if these bad things happen, you're still in pretty good shape against passive attackers if you implement elliptic curve, Diffie-Hillman, ephemeral. Um, like I said before, crypto is an ecosystem, and unfortunately the ecosystem is not really set up to support ECC. Um, there are a bunch of ECC root certificates, and there are a bunch of companies that have the ability to issue ECC certs, but in our testing, we were not able to find one domain validated company where we could upload an ECC CSR. We know they exist, ECC certs exist in the SSL observatory, um, and we know that you can buy them from the managed PKI services, but those managed PKI services usually start in like the $5,000 range, so to normal web, uh, masters, this is a very difficult thing to do right now. Um, DNSSEC is another algorithm that we talk a lot about, especially in the future when we have f t technology like Dane, which can replace the public, uh, the, the public certificate authority system to bootstrap trust, that DNSSEC becomes very important. Currently, the root KSK key signing key was signed in a ceremony in 2010. They used algorithm 8, and this is the list of algorithms that's supported by DNSSEC. Algorithm 8 is RSA with SHA-256. Um, Right now, the, the rules say that the, the, the root KSK will be rotated either when necessary, which is an interesting uh, means like when bad things happen, um, or five years, whichever comes first. And so we're coming up on having to plan that. And so right now, IANA, VeriSign, who has the contract to operate the root zone from IANA, and the SSAC, which is the safety and, uh, Security and Safety Stability uh, Working Group, uh, at basically the only people at ICANN that know what they're talking about um, are looking at different options of how to handle this. Uh, ECC has been talked about but is not definitely happening. Um, the reason people are talking about ECC is actually to make the zone file smaller. Anybody here who's dealt with DNSSEC realizes that the problem is if you use like a 1024-bit RSA key and you have a couple of entries that you very quickly run out of the UDP uh, data, uh, datagram size. And so you have to use things like eDNS, which uses big UDP datagrams, or TCP DNS, which opens you up for denial of service attacks. Um, a very interesting data point along the lines of the, the, the crazy man NSA warning us uh, is that when it was time to sign .ru, the Russian government refused to allow RSA to be used and said that .ru had to be signed with Ghost, which is the Russian equivalent of Sweet B based upon elliptic curve cryptography. I'll let that uh, lay and you can think about what that means. Um, clearly, Blackberries use ECC extensively. That's why they bought Certicom. Um, OpenVPN uh, uses OpenSSL, which has ECC support, but we weren't able to get it to work. Um, IPsec, you know, generally uses symmetric encryption, but there's an ICANN shake to, to, to come up with a symmetric key. Most of the advertised companies do support um, some kind of elliptic curve handshake uh, to up load the Ike. Uh, and then it turns out OpenSSH has ECC support. Um, and there's been some interesting discussion of people posting how do you generate yourself an ECC key to use for SSH, which is, turns out not to be that hard. It's just not the standard way of doing it. So what should you do now when you leave this room? So if you are an operating system or vendor of a, of a widely used language, first thing you do is try to make ECC easy to use. Uh, there is a, a, uh, library called, that's spelled NACL by Dan Bernstein. He pronounces it SALT, which is a little 
irritating. Um, but he gives you these functions, box and unbox, that make it very easy to encrypt and decrypt using ECC and a, a secure symmetric algorithm um, data without having to understand how ECC works. That's a, a good example if you want to copy an API to look how he does it. You need to update your documentation to push developers away from RSA. There's a lot of people who just go into the standard TechNet or MSDN crypto API documentation and that's how they use it. In that standard documentation, the standard um, example code almost always uses Diffie Hellman in, in RSA. Uh, you need to start to get aggressive about compatibility testing. We're going to run, as people move to ECC, we're going to run the problems just like we have with IPv6, right? Where network vendors slap a sticker now with IPv6 on the box. And that's true in a lab situation. But when you start to have real interoperability, you run into all kinds of weird problems. We're going to have the same thing with ECC because we don't have 10 years of compatibility testing. Uh, and you need to eat your own dog food. All of us who write software know unless the software developer themselves is using something, it doesn't actually work, right? Um, so please start using ECC internally and in your own systems. If you're a browser vendor, you need to make TLS 1.2 a P1 feature. Um, right now, the only browsers to support TLS 1.2 with ECC is IE 11 and Chrome 29, both of which pre-release. And I want to give a round of applause to Microsoft for beating Chrome at something. So congratulations, <laughs> Microsoft. Um, we need to push at the CA browser forum, which is supposed to regulate the CAs and doesn't really, but we need to push them to come up with a standardized process for cross-line certificates and to set a date at which ECC will be available by all the CA browser forum members. Um, if you make other kinds of software, uh, you should support TLS 1.2 on your endpoints when possible. You know, if, if you are building a system where you control the client and the server, there's no reason to use RSA in the public PKI system. You can use ECC, use a self-signed cert, and then do certificate pinning um, instead of using a PKI. And that will, that will solve this problem for you if you control both sides, like in a mobile app scenario. Um, you need to build your crypto systems to be pluggable, to have cryptographic agility. And if you're going to build those new systems, use ECC by, by default. And you can retrofit your old systems using some complicated ways. And if you're a certificate authority, let us buy ECC certs. There's going to be a market for it. Um, you should make some of that money. Um, change your documentation to say this is how you generate an ECC cert. A lot of people generate their certs based upon the, the standard docs at these companies. Um, and then again, work at the CA browser form on this. And if you're BlackBerry, you have the chance to make the world a safer place by going and giving us a global license. This is, there's honestly not a company in the world that has the opportunity BlackBerry has right now, which is through a legal document to make the world much safer. And they could do it simply by, by publicly licensing and saying any implementation using Suite B or the NIST standard curves for any purpose will not be sued under our patents. They'll still make money in scenarios where people want to do ECC in crazy ways. Um, and I know it's, this is a bad time to tell BlackBerry to give up any revenue, but, you know, <laughs> Hopefully there are some good people there that realize, A, they can do a right thing, and B, if the crypto Pompeii happens, um, then your patents are not going to last. There's no government in the world that is going to allow you to put a gun to the head of American industry or the industry of each of those countries um, and say you have to use RSA because we have patents. That's not going to happen. So do it now before your patents get canceled by Congress in an emergency session. Um, oops, that was the wrong button. And if you're just a normal company, um, use ECC where possible. That's, that's actually really hard right now because most of the internal PKI systems, like the Microsoft Certificate Authority and stuff, do not easily support ECC. But if possible, you should do it. Um, bug your vendors to make it easier to use ECC. Turn on elliptic curve, Diffie Hellman ephemeral, perfect forward secrecy today. This doesn't require changing your cert or doing anything difficult. This just means adding this, uh, moving up that crypto system in the list of preferred. Uh, uh, packages uh, in OpenSSL or in your load balancer. This will protect you again against passive attacks. Active attacks won't do much for you. And go survey your exposure so you know if a bad thing's happened, you have on a piece of paper, these are the things we need to fix. Either we turn certain things off, we put other mitigations in place, or we try to fix it very quickly. So in summary, Discrete crypto systems often depend on the discrete logarithm problem and factoring. And in both these areas, there have been huge advances in the last six months. We need to move to stronger crypto systems that use more difficult mathematical problems. And there's a huge amount of work done, so we need to start doing that immediately. So I've got six minutes. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do we look at Shor's algorithm? No. Yes, sir. Or ma'am, sorry. I'm, I can't see. I'm blinded. Uh, 
I, I'm going to need you to use the mic. You know what? We're running out of time, so I'm just going to end it here, and then we'll be here, and we can talk more offline if anybody has questions. Thank you very much for coming.